Welcome to our crusade service here in Baltimore, Maryland, where we've been having a very wonderful and thrilling time. Tonight, I'm going to speak on the subject, how to be happy. So many people these days are anything but happy. How do you find real lasting happiness? That's what I want to talk on tonight. I hope you'll call a friend and tell them and have them tune in. We welcome all of you tonight who have come to the service here at Memorial Stadium, and especially you, you who have joined us by means of television. A beautiful evening here in Baltimore, Maryland, one of the most beautiful states in the whole United States. I really believe it. And I'll tell you, this, this city of Baltimore, all these cities have the most wonderful seafood you can imagine and uh, we're beginning to show it i'm afraid but uh, we're so glad you've joined us by the way on your screen tonight you'll find a telephone number in most of the cities across the nation that number is there for one primary purpose so that we might help you with a spiritual need a spiritual problem so as you see the number right now, if you want to call our office, whatever that number indicates, we have counseling centers across the United States with trained counselors standing by ready to help you. You call that number. This could well be the most important phone call you'd ever make. Right now, I'm happy to present to you Larnell Harris. He really needs no introduction to Christian people and to young people all across the nation. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. You've been reading about him on your bulletin. He's been with us before in Crusades. Let's welcome him here to the stadium in Baltimore, Maryland tonight. God bless you. Waters, Lord. Yeah. You know, the, the field here is the home field for the Orioles, of course, and then the pro football team, the Baltimore Colts. And uh, tonight we've, we have a, a young man on the platform who's going to come up here and just share with you what Jesus Christ means to him. He's defensive tackle for the Baltimore Colts, Joe Ehrman. You know him and we welcome him tonight. Joe.
Joe's wife, Paula, is here on the platform. Paula, would you stand? We want to welcome you. We're glad to have you. Fine. Joe was involved with our youth committee and Greg Strand in going to a good many of the high school assemblies, youth meetings, before the crusade began. And Joe, we want to thank you for your encouragement, oh, and sharing you. your faith with them. Another interest of Joe is the Ronald McDonald houses. They're very unique, really. It's housing for the parents of, I believe, uh, cancer-stricken children. Is that right, Joe? And uh, it's a unique ministry, it's a unique project, and Joe is interested in that. But most of all, we've asked him to come to share what Jesus Christ means to him. And Joe, we're just delighted to have you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, I find it quite ironic that I'm here to share about Jesus Christ in the football field, that I've been here for eight years, and it's played such an important role in my life. Uh, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I grew up in a home that I didn't have any religious back background whatsoever. When I was 13 years old, I found a religion and I found a God. Mine was the God of football. I totally dedicated my life and myself to achieving my end, and that was being a football player. Well, I did really well with my religion and my God. I made high school All-American. I got a college scholarship to Syracuse University. I was a college All-American, and in 1973, I fulfilled my childhood dreams by becoming a Baltimore Colts. I truly had accomplished everything that I ever wanted I had all the woodly go goods. I had a great number of people patting me on the back. But there was only one thing that was more important to me in my life than my football, and that was my family. In particular, it was my brother Billy, who was 10 years younger than I am. When he was five, I was 15. I was already a big star in our neighborhood. He grew up to idolize me and to truly love me, and I worshiped him. When he had a problem, when he had a question, he came to me, and I always had the answers. My brother grew up big and strong. He was 6'3", 235 when he graduated from high school. Was quite a football player in his own, own right. Entering his freshman year of college, I got him a job here in Baltimore working with the Baltimore Colts to help further his football career. One day early in preseason, as I was coming off the field, my brother came up to me and showed me black and blue marks throughout his body. I looked at him and thought he'd just been exerting himself too much, too hard. Well, our team trainer saw him, our team trainer sent him to a doctor. That night I got a call from the doctor asking me if I was pleased to rush him to Johns Hopkins Hospital immediately. The very next day, a doctor pulled me in the room and told me my brother had terminal cancer. He had approximately six months to live and there was almost no hope for him. Well, what a shock. I had been doing so well, I thought I had my life so in order to be taken back. My brother's hopes and dreams and aspirations at 18 years old weren't to be. I spent the nights and days with him at Hopkins Hospital. He came to me with his problem, and for the first time, I didn't have an answer. I was totally helpless. And I remember when he started on chemotherapy, just laying on my cot next to his, be his bed, just crying. Just I was hopeless, and for the first time in my adult life, I think I took the time to truly realize there was a God. There had to be a God. There had to be some kind of order. Well, I spent the first week with my brother, and after a week, I came back to football. We had a preseason game here in the stadium with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Football my whole life, and I felt I owed it to the team. And as I walked in the locker room, I broke down because I related so much of my life and my brother's and what my brother was going through. Well, we played the Pittsburgh Steelers, and in the fourth quarter, they put on a long drive, and we kind of got tired, and, and they scored a fourth-quarter touchdown and won the game. And after the game, our then coach, Ted Marchibroda, had the team and was giving them an after the game pep talk, really chewing the team out, saying that we didn't have the right priorities, we didn't want to win bad enough, we didn't want it bad enough in our lives. And I remember sitting on my stool thinking, no, 28 years I truly thought that I truly believed that the football was so important, it's really not. To have a hope, to have a future, and to have a purpose in your life is truly something. That's what life's about. Well, my brother spent four and a half months at Hopkins. After he had exhausted every ray of hope, my mother, my father, and my two sisters, we decided to take him home to my Cockeysville home and let him die at home. We had Christmas for him that night on December 16th, and we felt we were truly blessed by having him home. The next morning, my mother woke me up. She was concerned that my brother had slept so long. I went into the room, and I found my brother laying there cold. <coughs> 
stiff. Life had gone out of him, and I totally lost. I started screaming into his ear, hoping for some kind of response, but my brother was dead. My brother was gone. I had five months to prepare for his death, but the reality of death totally took me back. Well, following his funeral, I suffered some real pain and a real sense of loss. And I had some real questions that I had to find the answers to. One, if there truly was a God that loved us, how could he allow this to happen? How can there be so much suffering and so much unfairness in this world? I had to find the answer to that, and I, ha I had to find it fast because I was really hurting. Well, I'm fortunate I had a friend that led me to Jesus Christ, and I found that God truly does live and truly does love us. But God recognizes that man does have a problem. That is that we're separated from him by sin, but he loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. You see, God had a baseball team, and he wanted all of us to be on his team. And to be on that team, we had all the rewards of heaven. But there was one requirement to be a member of his team. That is that we had a bat a thousand percent. A thousand. That's no strikeouts, no pop-ups, no fly balls. A thousand percent. Well, George Brett, the greatest hitter of all time, one of the greatest hitters of all time, had a fantastic season last year, and he batted 390. How can God expect us to bat 1,000? Well, God's got a solution to that problem. God allows us to have a designated hitter. That designated hitter is Jesus Christ. He bets 1,000 every time. I've taken Jesus Christ as my designated hitter, and I've found joy and the peace and a meaning in my life, not only in my personal life, but my professional life. I have a purpose to glorify God. See, God has a gift for each and every one of us. The gift is eternal life and a gift of salvation. But it's a gift. It's not ours until we take it. And I'd like to just say it really works and it's true and it's real. Take it. Thank you. We'll go back to the meetings here in Baltimore in just a few moments. Let's go to the service. I have a friend who abides in my heart. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. I cannot live from his presence apart. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. Wonderful Savior is He, wonder of wonders, that He should love me. Someday His glorious face I shall see, oh, what a wonderful Savior. He will the vilest of sinners forgive. His touch can make live, oh, what a wonderful Savior, oh, what a wonderful Savior is He, wonder of wonders, that He should love me. Someday His glorious face I shall see. As most of you already know that are watching by television, we're in the Memorial Stadium here in Baltimore, Maryland. And what a fantastic city this is. This is a city on the move. I've never been to a major city like this before and seen such a spirit in a city as there is here in Baltimore in its revitalization program. Last night was a little sad, though, in Baltimore because uh, Earl Weaver and the O's uh, <laughs> uh, 
play, they played against Billy Ball out in Oakland, and it didn't turn out too well. And I'm using Earl Weaver's office, so I'll offer an extra prayer. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that uh, I'm praying that they'll win because I may go to the next town they're going to be in. I don't know what their schedule is. In fact, he's got in the office the schedule there, but he doesn't have the dates. And uh, maybe he got mixed up and thought he was playing some other team last night. I don't know what happened. But I think a lot of Earl Weaver and all that wonderful gang that is called the Baltimore Orioles. You know, it's an interesting thing because my, my father-in-law, uh, was a baseball pitcher, a professional baseball pitcher for the Richmond, Virginia, way back in the teens when Baltimore at that time were, were in some big league. I don't know what league they had then. And he was sold to Baltimore. And I think he pitched two or three games for Baltimore, and then he felt called to go to the mission field. And he went, <laughs> and he went to med school, became a great doctor and a great writer in 25 years in China, where my wife was born and reared. And so Baltimore and the Orioles have a little connection in our family. I don't know whether he won or lost those games, uh, but he did have a sudden call. And, uh, <laughs> but tonight I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse, the fifth chapter through verses 12, verse 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now that word blessed actually means happy. It's translated blessed, but it actually means happy. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which went before you. Now this is the formula that Jesus gives us for happiness. Eight different times he uses the word happy. Now, if you turn to the 23rd chapter of Matthew, you will find eight times he says, whoa. Now, I'd never noticed that before, and I was talking to one of my daughters, who's a Bible teacher, and she said, Dad, have you ever noticed that those woes are the exact opposite of what he says on happy? In other words, the woe means miserable, and if you want to know how to be miserable, follow Jesus eight times in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. I'll let you do that for your homework when you go home tonight because we don't have time tonight to do it. In fact, tonight, I'll only probably get through about four of these because uh, I cannot take uh, eight uh, of these tonight in so short a time. 